Y hoy en concierto en los sofá nos ponemos internacionales. Productor, guitarrista, compositor, mi héroe personal de la guitarra, Timo Tolki. Bienvenido. Estoy realmente nervioso porque quien no conozca a Timo es un héroe de la guitarra que nos viene acompañando desde Finlandia. Él es guitarrista de varias bandas. Yo lo conocí personalmente por una que se llama Stratovarius, donde una de sus canciones fue uno de mis, de mis exámenes en la escuela de música. Entonces, que él nos acompañe, todavía no lo creo, ¿no? Todavía no creo tenerlo aquí al lado, pero bienvenido. Thank you. Eh, háblanos desde el principio. Eh, en tu casa, ¿no? Tus papás eran músicos y por eso tomaste la guitarra. ¿O, o cómo funcionaron las cosas? Well, um... My mother told me that I was like three when I was like uh, by the radio listening to the Beatles, okay. uh, dancing to it, and, like, even singing it. So, and I was five when I like got in touch with the guitar for the first time. It was like um, like a steel string, six okay. string. It was my cousin had it? He played guitar. So I was alone in this room. It was I still remember. It was like black guitar, and I, I was like. I was watching it and I, I did like this. Es bellísimo. And I memorized the, uh, the notes of the six strings. Two years after, when I was seven, I got my first guitar as a Christmas present. Oh, 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 oh. It was like nylon string okay. guitar. And I could tune it because I remember the notes. So I could tune it by ear. Nosotros aprendimos a hacer eso como cinco años después de que empezamos a tocar guitarra. No me parece que este chico sea muy listo. Yeah, I, it seems I had it like somehow since the birth, you know. Yes. It can't be, can't be explained in any other way, so. I think some people have this, you know. Tú lo tienes, ¿no? Yeah, I, I think so. Some, some people have this. ¿Qué, yeah. tipo de, ¿Qué tipo de música oías en tu casa? Well, my father was listening to a lot of music. I mean, there was always music. Play, played in my house and uh, ever since I was like three so he was listening to already like Uriah Heep, Deep Purple bands like this, a lot of Finnish pop music okay. and a lot of ABBA, a lot of Beatles so my origins are in, in, in the Beatles and the ABBA that's where I come from still, today, yeah <laughs> so my sense of melody comes Basically from the Beatles and ABBA. ¿Cómo es que, o sea, tú le pides a, a, a tu familia que te meta a clases de guitarra? Yeah, I went, when I was seven uh, or eight, I went to the school. Like, in, in my school they had a class for guitar. So I, I learned like the basic chords. Okay. You know, the very basic. And I started um, like playing that. But it took many years before it really started. ¿Y a qué edad lo empezaste a tomar en serio? Um, I think I was 13 when I heard smoke on the water. Ok. You know, I had the radio on and I heard... The, 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 that was it. <laughs> so I wanted to become Blackmore. Of course. And that, after that there was no turning back. So I wanted... My mother bought me Stratocaster and, you know... Hay una historia donde me parece que, que te robaron esa esa guitarra en uno de en un concierto, ¿no? Yeah, Someone they still. stole it. Simios imbéciles. Uh, in Denmark. Aquí también en México nos roban muchas cosas. ¿sí? Like <laughs> Lo llevo, esto es una caricatura, ¿o qué demonios? Vámonos, fuga. The first Stratovarius gig I ever played, I lost my guitar. But I just signed a deal with ESP. So I'm gonna have ah. Bueno, uh, o sea, nada más, ¿no? A nosotros nadie nos, nos, este, nos patrocina, pero bueno. Hay destinos peores que la muerte. No tenemos el talento. I mean, I had a deal with ESP like 15 years ago. They they built me like 14 ESP Stratovarius models. Wow. And I was like, I broke maybe four on stage. Yeah. I especially remember in Spain in Madrid one one incident because it's not that I want to do it, but it's always if I'm like frustrated, if, if I have like a bad sound or something, and and that was like bullfighting arena. Okay. Or like 30,000 people. And I was like having horrible sound. And <laughs> I, I thought like, I'm going to fucking break this guitar. <laughs> <laughs> But 
but I was hesitating for a moment. But then I saw in the audience a guy with a Nike shirt. Just do it. <laughs> and that was a sign. And then like, of course. Bah. Vaya, no encuentro fallas en su lógica. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And every Vamos a revisarla. And every and every time. I broke the guitar, I threw it to the audience, everything. Wow. I gave it away. So I never kept it. Eso es, eso, para los que somos tus fans, es oro, ¿no? Yeah, I think I've, I've broken like maybe six or seven. <laughs> <guitars>. <laughs> Todos estamos como muy, muy al pendiente de, de tu manera tan virtuosa de tocar. ¿Tenías algún, alguna especie de, de, de rutina para llegar a ser tan bueno? I was like around 16 or 17 when I started playing 8 hours a day and I did it for 10 wow. years. Wow. Eso explica muchas cosas. So, you know, I even slept with my guitar. You know. I believe you. <laughs> And I, I, was, I still remember it because uh, I, I had this ABBA poster like, around, like above my bed. And yes. every morning when I woke up, I, I saw this blonde, like, oh, I'm in love with this. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nieta. So, yeah, but I, I, you know, I started, I can still play every rainbow solo there is. Ten years I played, I really dedicated myself to the guitar playing. Like eight hours, I woke up in the morning, started to play. Of course, the school suffered. I was away from the school, high school like 400 hours. I don't recommend that. But... <laughs> Oye, ¿y aprendiste tú solo, o sea, tocando tantas horas, o tenías instrucción, o sea, fuiste a una universidad de música como tal? I did take lessons about two years, but it was more like jazz. He, he wanted me to play like... Um... Miles Davis and... Uh, no, we did play, like I learned like basic jazz chords and stuff, but I hated it. And... You no, know, I never learned, I never did my homework, so when I went there, he was like pissed off because it's like... Basura, basura, mega basura. Why are you coming here? Because, you know, I just wanted to play Rainbow, you know, Blackmore and stuff. So. Because you are a genius, you can do that, but we have Well, to... I was 14, so, you know, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, But I, it's because I learned to read music, you know, the, okay. the theory, the basic. So that was good. Okay. Of yeah. course. Eh, investigamos que tuviste tres bandas antes de entrar a Estatrovarios. ¿Nos podrías platicar de esas bandas? Actually, I was never in, in Antidote. I played one show with them because they, their guitar player got sick. But I produced a lot of demos for them. Okay. Because I had many studios since I was like 20 in, in Helsinki. Okay. So Thunder was... Actually, Roadblock was the first. I think it was like 82. ¿Tú también ahí cantabas? Yes, I was singing, yeah. And, y tocando la guitarra. I sang and played guitar. ¿Y qué pasa? Eh, esa banda, ¿por qué ya no, ya no estás ahí? Um, well, I got a call from the drummer of Stratovarius. Okay. <laughs> and that's when, uh, you know, because their guitar player was like a little freak. We all are freaks. <laughs> But he was especially freak, so he didn't want to do this gig in Denmark. So he called me Tuomo Lassila, the drummer, uh, and he said if I want to play, because he, he was playing drums in Roadblock. That's how I knew him. Okay. So um, he told me that we have a gig in one week and you have to learn like 12 songs. I was like, you know, the early start of ours was really, really complicated stuff, you know, because this guitar player was really good. So he had a lot of like really <laughs> difficult arpeggios and stuff. Okay, sweet picking. No, at that time there was no sweet, sweet, sweet picking at all. But he did really weird stuff and I had to learn it like in two days or so. So we had one rehearsal, then we traveled this way to Denmark. It was horrible, it was winter. We, we couldn't afford hotels, so we were sleeping on the floors of some hotel. You know, wow. And stuff. And there was like this much snow. We were like, and finally we got to the place and we played the gig and then they stole my fucking guitar. So I came back to the <laughs> empty case. Llegas a Stratovarius y te haces cargo de cantar y de tocar la guitarra. Eh, 
¿Cómo fue tu proceso de composición para tus primeros discos? Well, it's the same today. I mean, I'm basically a channel. You know, I, I receive songs. They come like complete. Even the lyrics wow. sometimes. I write very fast. You know, my songs are usually born in 10 minutes. The prophecy is true. O sea, que compusiste Stratosphere en 10 minutos? I two minutes. <laughs> What? What the f No, o I sea, don't. nos acaba I de humillar a todos. That, because we we wanted to make like an instrumental for every record, you know, and we always wanted to have the strato word in there. Yes. I think we have three instrumentals with strato word. But in generally, uh, the way I compose songs is that I always start out with the title, song title. Okay. So I might wake up in the morning and I have, maybe I saw a dream or something and I have a name. And then when I have the name, it sort of tells me how it, the song could be. And then I take the guitar or piano, keyboards, yes. and the song comes. Wow. Yeah. It has always been like Hay algo que este joven no haga bien. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, it's 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 a long story actually, but I am I guess, but um, because I've been listening to so much music ever since I was a kid, so it sort of comes from like big pool of music, the whole thing, you know. Because somebody said that there's a theory that all the music has already been composed. You know? Yes, I know. We have o o only so and so many notes. And I think most of the musicians have problems with emotions and feelings. You know, they are very technical uh, and like, but I, I don't feel them, you know. Yeah. Because for me, music is only, only about transmitting emotions. It's, okay. it's an energy, you know. Like when you play to 6,000 people in Sao Paulo, like these guys are singing your, your lyrics and you you've actually feel the the energy coming, you know, it's physical. It's vibrating. Nosotros no sabemos qué es tocar ante tantas personas. We don't know how it's to, to play in front of, of that many people. Do you remember your best gig? ¿Tú recuerdas tu yes, mejor? I do. Eh, eh, yeah, concierto? that was actually 2006 in Caracas, in Venezuela. In Venezuela. Yes. And it was a weird day because we, we landed on the previous day just before the horrible thunderstorm. Okay. We could see it from the plane that it was sort of like following us. So we landed and then it started and it rained like the whole day and the whole next morning. And our tour manager, a German guy called AC, very cool guy by the way. Okay. He's an Aventasia tour manager. Okay. Uh, he said that maybe we have to cancel because it was like an amphitheater outside okay. for like 6,000 people. Wow. And it was raining. We were in Hilton, Caracas. I still remember that. And uh, we were waiting and waiting. And um, finally, then it stopped and the sun came. Okay. But it was already like four or five. So our roadies went there and they set it up, everything. And we, we went there and no sound check. And I still remember when we arrived, there was this huge line, like maybe one kilometer of people shouting, like, Sato, Wow. It's like, Amazing, you know. So we went there. I think this is in YouTube, this concert somewhere. Lo vamos a buscar para que lo pongamos ahorita en pantalla. It's 2006 in Caracas. So I think it's maybe the best gig of my life because the people were like, because bands really don't go there, you know, especially now, but even at that time. But we went and they really appreciated it, you know. ¿Cuándo fue la primera vez que viniste a, a Latinoamérica? When was the first time you come here to Latin America? 97 to Brazil. And and ¿y sabías eh, toda la fan base que tenías aquí en en América? No, we didn't. We were completely like we we went to a place called Recife in Brazil. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a funny story because it was a festival at the beach. So we we arrived to the hotel and we we were looking like Man, there's no stage. So these Brazilians, we were supposed to go on stage like one in the morning. We 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 came to the hotel around six, and they were building the stage. We were hammering like wow. we heard like hammering. <laughs> so we we ended up going on stage like 5 a.m. 
And I still remember, because it was like, it's Ecuador, it's the ocean, you know, by the beach. Yes. So I, I was playing Will the Sunrise when the sun was actually coming up. Will the sun Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the moments I will never forget. Okay. Yeah. ¿Y cuando eh, fue la primera vez que estuviste aquí en México? When was the first time you come here to Mexico? I think it was 2000. 2000 en Circo Volador. Yeah. ¿Y cómo te recibió el público mexicano? The, well, the whole Latin America is amazing, always, you know. I mean, you guys are amazing. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, we know. Like 97, when, when we came here for the first time, like to Brazil and stuff, Chile and Argentina, we really didn't know how it is here. So we were like completely like, what is going on? You know, we had played to big audiences before in Europe and Japan, but n never we heard like so loud audience. <laughs> Because our, our sound guy even told us that, man, I mean, These, are so, these guys are so loud that I cannot even mix you because <laughs> you're, you're louder than the PA. Ese verga es mi ídolo a la verga. Wow. Yeah. We really like it. We love like. it too. I mean, I think it was funny because it was in Brazil. It was like the first time we were there, 97. We had a press conference in Sao Paulo. And of course, since we were there for the first time, there were a lot of journalists. And I remember that they only asked questions for, for me. And I got pissed off because I said, Look, there are other guys in the band too. Why of can't course. you answer to Koti Pelta, Jens Johansson, you know, Jörg Michael, you know. So I got a little pissed off about that. Yeah, you know. yeah. And how was your ascent with Stratovarius to be a more important band? Well, it was like gradual development. We started with Pride Night uh, in 88. And... Um, I knew I wanted to make something, you know. I had all these songs coming to me, so I, I, I wanted to make records and stuff. We did gigs in Helsinki, and many years we played to like 20 to 30 people you know, only. Nosotros también. Todavía yeah. tocamos para esas personas nosotros. So we did like, we did Fright Night, Twilight Time, Dream Space, and... Dreams. The Twilight Time was actually when it started taking off in Japan. Yeah, Twilight Time was like the biggest selling import album, even bigger than ABD. Wow. Yeah, so that's when I actually went there for the first time for the promo. Uh, that was like 93. So, and it was my first time like in, in Far East. So it was a long way like Helsinki, Frankfurt, Seoul, Korea, Tokyo. And Korean Air, which is, I would never fly that again. It was like, Why? Because they had many accidents. These guys don't care. So, <laughs> and I, I had like a guy from Australia sitting next to me telling like, Timo, these guys have like bomb threats every week. Like, <laughs> wow. And it was horrible. It was night flight, horrible turbulence. It was like really bad. That's the origins of the song Distant Skies. Wow. Oh. So I arrived to Tokyo and there were these like 100 people at the airport with teddy bears and shit and stuff and gifts and everything. You know, it was amazing, you know. So I went to the hotel and I was like, what is this, you know. You know, we had like fan meetings and stuff and they were so kind and polite, you know. ¿Qué hiciste con todos los regalos que te dieron? You I couldn't, I couldn't possibly take it back, you know. <laughs> my, my, my suitcase, you know, of there's course. no way. So there were so many gifts, <laughs> you know. And... Um, Tú encontramos en nuestra investigación que decides dejar la parte vocal porque a la hora de tocar en vivo no tenías el mismo sonido que buscabas. ¿Cómo fue el proceso de encontrar a alguien que te reemplazara cantando? We did this Dream Space tour in Japan, which, which was like the first tour in the, in, in outside Finland. And of course, I, we all felt like big rock stars, so I was like drunk for a week <laughs> you know. and you know I, I was like man I was drinking so much and I, I really couldn't sing because I had horrible hangover every morning you, know. <laughs> you just went for, for the vibe and, and you know we played like four gigs and uh, 
the, after the last gig, we were in the bullet train back to Tokyo, and I had like a our record company was JVC Japanese JVC Victor, and the guy said to me, Timo, because they're always very polite, we can maintain this level, but if you want us to go further, you have to have a singer, and I agreed. So we had a festival after that in Finland, which I cancelled, and then I put an advertisement to the local newspaper, music paper. We're looking for a keyboardist and, and, um, uh, singer. and a singer. Yeah. And there were two guys, and the other one was Cody Pelt. Wow. Yeah. So I went to see this Timo, and I ring the bell, and this beautiful guy with long blonde hair opens the arms. <laughs> like, okay. Es un papucho. Su cara parece tallada por los mismos ángeles. Okay. That's the guy. <laughs> already, already I knew, but then he played a demo, his, his own song, and I, after four notes I knew this is the guy, you know, because it was fucking great. And he told me that, like, come on, listen to it, listen to the song, so, because I said, you got a job already. And so we, because we were recording Fourth Dimension already at that time, so I was seeing, there exists the demo where I sing all the songs of Fourth Dimension. Okay. So Timo came to the studio and it was a summer, I think, uh, 94, 94. So he came to the studio and, and we were singing like Fourth Reich and stuff like that. And I still remember because he was singing so loud that he had a mic like this far. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And it was evident that that's the guy, you know. So then we started recording because everything was done, and in the same sessions, I, I, we, we recorded my first solo album, classical variations and, and other yes, themes. Yes, yes. It's the same sessions. So we were starting to do the vocals, and we did all the vocals in about two weeks, and I mixed it, and that's when it really started to take off. ¿Qué diferencia? En, en, como compositor encontrabas en escribir para Stratovarius como para tu álbum solista? Well, the difference is always that the key element is the vocalist. If I know who is the vocalist, it's easier for me to write a song for him or her. And in the case of myself, I know what I'm capable of and what I want to express. So it's really up to the vocalist. Un gran poder conlleva una gran responsabilidad. Las cosas siguieron avanzando y te volviste tú y la banda íconos, íconos del metal. Eh, pero empezaron, empezaron a cambiar los integrantes. ¿Cómo fue, eh, cómo, cómo la música fue evolucionando en, en estos nuevos álbumes? Well, I knew I can do better. So I knew I have to say goodbye to some of the guys. And that unfortunately was the, the founder of Stratovar, Tuomo. I was very frank, I was direct, I said, look, I'm sorry, but it's just no way you can play the, the stuff that I have in mind, you know, and so then, because I knew Jörg Michael from a tour I mixed in Germany, he was playing in a band called Headhunter, and this was a guy, like, was so amazing showman, you know, on stage, how he played drums was, like, out of this world. <laughs> So after this tour I mixed, was actually Antidote was one of the bands. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I called him up and because he was playing in Running Wild at that time, a German band. So I, I told him, Jörg, I have this band, Stratovarius, and if you would be interested. And he said, he said, send me the demo. And he really liked, I had the song, of, like episode, like four or five songs, demos. Okay. I sent it to him and he liked it and he said, okay, I'm, I want to come in, but I'm also in running one. I said, no, you can't. I want to have like a stable band member. So he had to choose. And then he chose us. And of I course. think he did the right. <laughs> yes. It's the same with Jens Johansson. I got his uh, address from Japan. So I sent him a fax. And he answered uh, something like that. Also, like, please send me the demos. So the origins were really in the music, in the songs. So the guys came to Helsinki, we did episode, and that's when it, I really knew that this is going to be big, you know, when we were in Phoenix doing the episode, you know. Yeah, that's you realize, that's I, I really, I knew, every, we all felt it, you know, it's like, this is, 
the really we, we are doing something magical. Bueno, lo anterior ya era, ya era mágico, just... Yeah, but it's like completely new level, I mean, you know, it's like... Musically. Every, in every level, production-wise, the vocal-wise, even the playing-wise, you know, there were suddenly keyboard solos, we had these duets with Jens and stuff, you know. Like, I think we were really the band who defined the power metal sound with episode in 96. We spent, like, a lot of money for that album, you know. We put so many months to the production. So, um, ¿cómo reaccionaron los los fans a este cambio de estilo? Porque estamos muy acostumbrados a que los los que son fans del metal son gente muy apasionada. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo reaccionaron? Well, we realized that we we suddenly had a lot more fans because we we were able to do really the first world tour. So we went like all over Europe, everywhere. So I was in Italy for the first time. It became really big. Greece was huge. Even Germany was very good, and, and, and all the parts. Spain, of course. Yeah, so, so the fan base increased. Yeah, a lot. I would say like 60%. percent. Wow. Yeah. Luego de lo que nos platicaste, viene el disco más amado por tus fans, que es Visions. Eh, ¿tienes, ¿Tienes alguna razón por que, la que crees que, que amaron tanto este disco? Well, it was even more simple than episode. <laughs> I mean, the songs, <laughs> the songs were like, uh, you see, in my life, uh, it always like it's like this. You know, every other album is sort of like sad, and the, every other album happy. So, Visions is one of the happy albums, and um, it's just. Um, The songs are so good, you know. The song material was so strong. That's why the fans like it, you know. You like it? As well, but my, my favorite album of Stratovarius is actually Elements. Elements. Yeah. But Visions was really when it really took off, you know. Wor uh, worldwide, globally. So, you know. Okay. I mean, the black, uh, you know, okay, some people know about this, but Black Diamond I wrote for my dog. What? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Was it, so it was like a bearded collie, the dog which has hair, like cannot see. You know? Okay. It's like black diamond. So I had my my cork M1 with the harpsichord sound. I was like fucking around with it, like did and like did do did do it. Okay, this sounds cool. And the dog was in the same room. <laughs> and the dog started licking my feet when I was doing. Do, 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 do. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is that that dog's name was Rape, which is Finnish name. But it's a girl, it was a girl, but it's a guy's name. I gave her a guy's name. Okay. But in English, it's a rape. Wow! <laughs> Tranquilo, tampoco lo entendía la primera. And in the interviews, I told the story, and they were like, how can you, you know, I'm sorry, but it's a man's name. So, and even Kotipelta didn't know that it's for a dog. So it was. One gig, I still remember this. He was sing he's singing the songs like, I see you standing there watching me, you know. And I, I whispered and said, you know, Timo, all these years you've been singing this to a dog. <laughs> <laughs> he stopped like, and then he got it actually, you know. I could see it. <laughs> he, he stopped for a moment and then he continued, but it was funny. <laughs> but this, this song is made for a dog oh. called Rape, no rape. No. <laughs> <laughs> Para quien sea su canción favorita, ya saben. Luego vinieron dos álbumes más y tomas, se toman un descanso de la banda. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo fue esa parte para ti como compositor después de llevar tanto tiempo componiendo a detenerte y ir otra vez por tu disco solista? Well, it was really not a break because we, we released this intermission album. Your solo. No, I did a second solo actually, Dream to Life. Yes. But we did like Infinity. And then we had the break. But I wrote all the songs of Him to Life on the tour of Infinity. Okay. Because, you know, on tour, you have so much time. You know, you wake up, whatever, 10, 12 in the bus, and the gig is at 10 or 11. So you have like almost 12 hours of nothing to do. So I figure out, I have all this time in my hands, so I'm going to write songs. So I book always a hotel for the day. And I went to the hotel and I had some recording equipment, and I wrote all the songs. Of him to life on, on that tour. 
cuando estás de tour, ¿cómo, cómo practica la banda? ¿Cómo ensaya? Well, at that point, we just had like a couple of days rehearsals. I mean, we call them PA rehearsals. We, we, we have the set list and, and uh, we go to some club. <música> Usually in Helsinki it was, and we play two days the set, and the sound man is doing the things and stuff. So, you know, at that point, like Infinity, we were so, we did like fucking thousand shows already, so we were like a <laughs> machine, you know. There was not, nobody could stop us, you know. It was so easy for us, you know. So we just tried to make a perfect set list and, and you know, for the fans and, and, you know, then went for the road. Okay. Yeah. Tu último disco, Stratovarius, eh, ahí, ahí eh, encontramos, la última vez que tocaste con ellos fue en, fue en España. Decidiste, decidiste terminar. También, ¿cómo, ¿cómo se toma personalmente haber estado tantos años con una banda, el cariño que hay y partir hacia algo nuevo? Sí, fuimos a hacer lo que llamamos el Black Album de Stratovarius, que fue un poco diferente. Uh, because you have to understand, we, we, every album was better, like Fourth Dimension, Episode, Visions, Destiny, Infinity, Elements, and then you reach the top. Where do you go from there? Down. Okay. So I, I did what I always did. I composed the songs and the guys, the, we all felt it's different. So we did the album and it wasn't bad. We did a good tour with Hammerfall co called uh, Stratohammer. It was oh, like wow. <laughs> a really long tour, actually, and a good one. And then, like always, came time to write another album, which became then Revolution Renaissance. So we, we, we otra banda que tuvo. Yeah, él fue, but eh, I wrote the songs for Stratovarius first, and we really went to the studio in Helsinki and we recorded the songs. But something was not there. We had lost something and. The moment I realized that something is wrong was in Wacken, in front of like 50,000 people. We were playing a song called Last Night on Earth. And I was playing it, I was looking around. I, I, I thought, like, nobody is into this. You know? Just playing because they, they have to play. I, don't, I cannot explain otherwise than that I had a feeling that this is over. You know? I have to do something else. Ese día algo cambió dentro del Lotso. So, But we tried to record it and it, I edited the drums about a week and I couldn't get it. So I, I just told the guys, look, I think it's fair that we, we call it quits and like we, you go on your ways and I go my way and you know, it's the best for everyone because this is not going to work. We were like the Beatles. They were like seven years as well, seven or eight years. Yes. You know, so, And in retrospect, that was the right decision. Of course, the beginning was very difficult for me because um, I was working with, okay, the Revolution Renaissance, new era. I got to work with Michael Kiske the first time. Okay. And Tobias Summit. So that was like, this guy is like, how he sings, he's like, no, not of this, from this world. <laughs> so uh, he, he sang like six or seven songs and then, But I never, you know, I never toured with Revolution Renaissance. Encontramos que fue eh, difícil la parte comercial de esta banda. Well, first of all, Revolution Renaissance was not really a band; it was a project because that was the first time I, I was working with a label, Frontiers, from Italy, and they are known to have like project bands. So I, I had musicians that play on the record, but I had not, I didn't have a band. So then I di did form a band for the next one, which became Age of Aquarius. We had like two Brazilians, like Gaspon Santos singer and Bruno Agra, the drummer. And I think a British guy in the bass and American guy in the keyboards. And they all came to Helsinki and we did the album. And it's a good one, but it seemed to me that nobody really cared about it, you know. It was like a job only, or no? It, it's very good album. It's something I wanted to do. I want. I didn't want to do like a copycat of Stratovarius. I wanted to do something different. But then again, I never write songs deliberately. I never write 
songs for the sake of ri just writing something. It's just something I express, and that's the album that just came, you know. And it's different. It's it's not really a power metal. It was different, and I guess people just want their black diamonds and paradises and stuff like that. But you cannot do paradise all your life. Yeah, you know. Creo que pasa y y conocemos muchas bandas no necesariamente de metal. Que, que pasa por lo mismo, porque cuando tú compras un disco, estás esperando el, prácticamente el disco anterior, pero con nuevas canciones. Pues sí, güey, no mames. Luego encontramos que viene Trinity en 2010 y Sinfonia. ¿Qué nos podrías platicar un poco de estos álbums? Trinity was like the continuation album of Age of Aquarius. And uh, I remember we went to Brazil to record the drums and the vocals to Sao Paulo. Okay. We had this guy who owned the studio, like, nice swimming pool and like really cool place wow so we did the drums and the vocals there and then everything else back in helsinki and the trinity is like also a very good album but it's still no power metal you know it's, it's more power metal than age of aquarius but still no and we could not tour so i decided that this is not going to work again i have to do something else okay and it just um Happened to be that Andre Matos, God bless his soul, um, happened to live in Sweden at that time, next to Finland. And we had toured with Angra, with Stratovarius before. So I knew the guy. Okay. I knew what he is capable of. He is and was one of the best power metal singers of all time. And I, I figured, okay, this guy lives like practically next to me. So I got his number. I called him up and said, come come to my home and let's talk about it and that's how it started so I wrote some demos for Sinfonia and went to Sweden we re recorded recorded the, the vocals and then we got a deal with Edel Records from Germany and we did this record In Paradisum which is that is a power metal album you know and that's what people were expecting but still for some reason it didn't take off like Stratovarius did you know Okay. I guess everybody sort of uh, felt the desire to have the original lineup back. You know, I, I guess they never really accepted that we went separate ways. You know. Y eso es precisamente lo que platicábamos porque los los fans del metal son son entrañables y, y no permiten prácticamente ningún cambio, ¿no? But I think because everybody fell in love with the original Stratovarius lineup, so of course it's like a divorce, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like I understand them, you know. But you know, you have to find the the balance between what you want to do and what your fans want. You know, you cannot please everyone. Claro. I don't think we are here to please everyone. You cannot be like that. Otherwise, you're just a slave. You know, you're a fake. You know. Y, y entiendo la parte tan importante que que es bueno en una banda pues todos todos aportan, pero al final pues estrato varios eran tus canciones. Tú eras, o sea. Tú eras el, el heart and soul, o sea, el, el, el corazón y, y, la, y el alma de Stratovarius. ¿Quién eres? Soy Dios. But you have to understand that there is also a new Stratovarius, which is completely different. I mean, yes. they have their own identity and they have great songs and, and great stuff too. And I think now, only now, they have accepted this, you know. Because whatever I'm doing now, people like it. And people like them, but of course everybody thinks because last April I was seeing their show in Helsinki, I was there, and uh, then we took a picture in backstage, and it had like hundred thousand likes in Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was like reunion, reunion, reunion. Tendrías una con ellos? Well, I think we should do something like a gig with like what Halloween is doing, like Pumpkins United. We we should do something like that because we we we. We, we, we recorded three different gigs and every time something went wrong. You know. <laughs> we couldn't use pyro in Milan, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, something went wrong, you know, and um, we couldn't use. So there still is not, a, not a, a show, like video show, where I am with a classic line. No, with a classic line. Ah, okay. That's why I, I've been telling the guys, because we are really good friends. You know, we are That's everybody right. has to know this. We have nothing against each other. We are really good friends. I support them and say they support me. 
Therefore, it is possible that in the future, let's say in a couple, of two, three, four years, we might rent a big place and, and make a show with two lineups. Wow. You know. Si vienes a México, quisiéramos ir nosotros. Ingenuo. Well, I think Circo Volador would be like a logical place to do it, you know, because I have so good memories. I played there last September. I was like in the backstage. I was sitting in the same chair when I was sitting in 2000. I remember that. Wow. I played in the smaller place, of course. We had like 800 people. It was cool. I went to the big side. Just I stood on the stage and I was feeling like, man. I've been here before. Wow. <risa> si, si estás consciente de que eres un, un héroe para todos los que estudiamos guitarra eléctrica. Well, I'm of course aware of it, but it's like, a, you know, at some point it goes to your head, this yellow liquid, because <risa> people tell you, maestro, God, you know, all this time. I hear it all the time. I'm like, I'm a really modest and simple guy, actually. You know. Por cierto, él, él ha sido el, el invitado con más renombre mundial que hemos tenido y fue la persona más sencilla para estar aquí con nosotros. Well, I mean, some people have very wrong idea about me because I'm very direct sometimes. You know, I, I say exactly what I think and <laughs> I shouldn't maybe, but that's how I am. And those people who don't like me or even hate me, if they would really meet me personally, I'm sure they would like me. You know. No, yo no encuentro manera de, de, de decir que es, ha sido más que genial con nosotros, o sea, y una persona sumamente amable. Well, I, because I, I believe that we all, basically, we are here to serve, you know. Okay. My, I was put on earth to be a musician, that's clear. Mm. So, I do realize my position, you know, to the fans. So, I'm able to use my talent to give people hope good feelings and stuff. So I'm using this talent. I have to, because that's why I'm here. Yes. You know. So I, I've never refused an autograph or photo or whatever, you know. I'm always there, you know. Es lo que un hombre hace. If somebody sees me on the street, they can always, hey Timo, can we talk? And I always, always do this. Este es el mejor pirata que jamás conocí. ¿Nos puedes hablar un poco de esta parte como operística que tuviste con, con Avalon? Yeah. Well, it all started at, at the end of Symphonia because we did the record and we went on tour. And we were in Latin America, but we had audiences like 200 people. And I was in Chile playing to 120 people or something. And we used to play in Teatro Calcopolitan for 3,000 people. And Andre Matos refused to sing Cotipel the songs for some reason. He said that out of respect towards Scotty Pelter, he doesn't want to sing. I was, I never understood this because I was, I started in, I, I remember I started playing Speed of Life. Everybody was suddenly like, really like, this 120 only, but really. <laughs> yes. And I realized that people really, really missed the, the Stratovarius. You know. Okay. And I felt really sorry for Andre because, you know, this guy was like an angel and so talented, you know, in all levels, great piano player, great composer, great vocalist, great guy, too intelligent for this world, too sensitive. <laughs> he was always speculating about everything and always like, yes, mm, 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 <laughs> he was like that. So we played like, we ended up to Sao Paulo to Blackmore's pub for like 100 people and that's like a low point, you know, because we played to Via Funchal to 6,000 people. And the tour ended to, to Santiago, and once again I knew that's the end of something. And then I was really like became depressed because it, sometimes you have to be depressed because there's a reason for depression. And I don't think you can actually medicate that. It, you can, of course, but it doesn't work. You have to what I call work of depression. You have to swim through it. And it might take years. You know. There's always a reason for it. And mostly depression is actually self-hate. It's subconscious. Most of us actually hate ourselves. Probablemente. ¿Cómo lo supo? Yeah, it's true. Because we learn this as we are kids. Because we grow up, we grow up in the authoritarian family system. So we are, we are 
sort of we learn to live in fear. Seven. Our system is like that most parents control their kids with fear and this is not the right way. So you learn to be afraid. And I learned very young that this world is not a safe place. So, ¿Te pasó uh, algo porque aprendiste eso tan joven? Yes, because I was 12 when my father committed suicide. Okay. You know, and I almost saw it. Wow. It was really close. And that morning I went to school. It was like early 8. I left school and I always had the same route. My, my uh, home was here, the school was here, my father's house was here. And I always went this way. But that morning I stopped here and I had a like, feeling, I have to go here. So I went and I, I like, went to my father's house and I watched, he was in the window of the fourth floor. I saw him, I was waving, but he didn't see me. And I went to the school and suddenly I had a break and I saw like ambulance and police coming. He had jumped from the fourth floor. Okay. I was like 100 meters from the school. Everybody ran there except me because I knew what happened, you know. And after he died, believe me or not, I wrote the, the first uh, theme of Destiny, the song. With an with organ. To my father. So I, I expressed my uh, longing and like, I missed him so much. Of course. I wrote this song beginning when I was 12. You know. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and my father is like, I forgave him years ago, you know, because he was in a really bad place emotionally. He doesn't, he couldn't live anymore. He didn't want, part of it wanted to die. And it was his decision. He was 33. Okay. He was really young. Yeah. Like you that. know, I went to therapy for seven years, actually. I had to because I was, you know, what we do is in psychology, we call, you repeat your childhood trauma. You, you all the time you find yourself in, in the same situation over and over again until you resolve it. There's a great book of Alice Miller called The Drama of the Gifted Child, which is exactly about this. Repeat, you repeat your, your tragedy. Whatever happened to you, you will repeat it when you're adult, yes. until you realize. And in therapy, I started to learn who I really am. You know? ¿Qué edad tenías cuando empezaste ahí en uh, terapia? I was, um, I think it was 90, uh, it was around, it was around infinity. I think I was, uh, I was like 34, something okay. like that. And seven years, I went every, every week to this guy. And it was um, when I went there, because my mother never told me what happened with my father, so I had to investigate it. And in Finland, if somebody commits suicide, the police has to make an investigation of okay. what happened. So I ordered all the records, the paperwork, the paperwork and even the fo they take photos. Wow. I you told you the, see the photos? I, st <laughs> I told the police, I don't want to see the body. Oh, okay. But he sent me a picture, there was a body in one of the pictures, but it was far, but I saw it. You know. And I, I, you know, I read all the, all the stuff and I realized what happened. I went into some kind of shock. So when I went to the therapy, for the, because in the therapy you have like initial interview if the therapist wants to take you. And I went to this guy and like he said that I'm in some kind of a, a weird shock situation because I felt really weird like sort of like expanded consciousness really I can't explain it but he took me there and he just said that you know we started and um, he was a weird guy because this particular therapy was it's called body psychotherapy it's like really physical okay you know and it is like a guy called Wilhelm Reich who was a student of Freud and uh, Freud was like um, doing, he had this couch and <laughs> Freud was here and the patient was here and the patient was what they call free association. Okay. But Reich was the first to, he took two chairs. So he was facing the... Face to face. Yeah. Okay. And you could d decide the distance of the therapist. And it is logical that uh, you resist the therapy in the beginning because you have to learn to trust a stranger. You know, you should be able Your to... Your deepest secrets yes. and feelings. So 
in, with some people it just doesn't work. And in, with me, it's always, always because these guys, they know their shit. So many times, you know, we started the session, he always asked, like, how do you feel? And I said, like, whatever. And then he didn't say anything. And I, I didn't know what to do. So I was like, many times, well, 40 minutes silence. Well, and I, I, I said something, but I felt like an idiot because I said it for the sake of to say something, okay. <laughs> you know. And slowly but surely, I started to open up, and then, you know, this this feeling started to come out, and you have no idea, you know, because uh, we record everything, 24 hours, everything, okay. what happens to us, all the thoughts, everything, everything that has happened to us is in our bodies, and this particular therapy is um, uh, thinking that we are sort of protecting us from the fear and from the there is a universal energy that is everywhere it's everywhere it's entering us but it cannot enter us if we are shielded of course and they call it muscular muscular armor and this therapy uh, aims to break this armor so they use like breathing techniques they use like a mattress and I saw, because I was in a couple of seminars of my therapist, and there was a guy, um, he did like some breathing exercises, and my therapist was like this, and was watching the guy, and he suddenly like pushed a part of his belly like this, and the guy jumped up and screamed like a maniac. Wow. Everybody was like, it was like from the exorcist. <laughs> really, everybody was fucking scared. <laughs> and I was in the same room with this guy. <laughs> so I was like, leaving, like. I scream, Miss Winkle. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, but you know, I, I started to realize that what I have inside is something I have been hiding and running away from like 20 years. You know. So I started having these like panic attacks and stuff like this and this kind of a wave of fear. It starts from the, from the feet and it comes. It's really that you have to go through it so you can be free from it. Of course. And that's what happened to me. So I paid like 30,000 euros <laughs> on, the, on the therapy. Creo que lo valieron. I think it's worth it. Yeah, it, it yeah. was worth it because especially with infinity and elements, I was so open. So the songs were like somehow like more positive, you know, because of this. Y cambió completamente, o sea, afectó directamente tu parte musical. No, no, that never changed. But because in my case, everything is very natural. I don't, I'm not a fake, you know, I'm, I'm, you, you, you get what you see. So I, I, um, I do what I like. I don't care what people say or think. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to express myself. If somebody likes it, very nice. A lot of people like it. If somebody <laughs> doesn't, okay, you have your freedom to do it. So, but I'm here to express myself, you know, and if people like this, it's the greatest compliment you can have, of course, you know. Wow. Yeah, but even if they wouldn't like, I would still do it because I have to. I would be dead without music. You know? Of course. And Ganaste durante tu carrera varios reconocimientos. Eh, ¿Tienes especial afecto por, por alguno? They mean nothing to me. Like, nothing. No. Okay. My enjoyment comes from actually the composing and creating, okay. expressing. You get gifts and stuff like that, you know, like gold discs and whatever, but they, they mean nothing to me. You know, oh. They're just like stuff. I have I gave everything away, my gold disc, to the fans, to the clubs, to the magazines, to okay. my daughter, you know. Okay. I have no gold discs. <laughs> <laughs> and I gave even my guitars away. So. So, so because tiene... there is a, uh, the way I see it, like, like whatever you put to the universe comes back to you ten times. Okay. So if you do bad things, that comes back. If you do good things, it comes back even more. Okay. So if you give love, you will receive that. Bien dicho, Arturo. Claro que sí. En algún momento de, de tu carrera tuviste contacto con eh, artistas latinos, o sea, con el, su música o algo por el estilo. Yeah, I mean, especially in Spain. I, 
I did produce a couple of bands there. And here, many, many bands are approaching me, like they want to do stuff with me. And I'm giving lessons here, so okay. guitar lessons. So I do have contacts here, and if somebody wants me to produce the stuff, I'm, I'm here. So Okay. Yeah. And I'm not even that expensive, you know. It always I always ask the budget of the band. I I, I usually accommodate myself to that budget, you know. Okay. Eh, Timo está nos estaba platicando que va a mudarse a vivir aquí a, a México por unos por un proyecto muy interesante que tiene. Nos puedes platicar al respecto, Ken? Yeah, I mean, I'm doing two projects at the same time. I do Infinite Visions, which is like a new band, and the songs are ready. We are doing demos at the moment. And suddenly the Frontiers, my old beloved Italian record company, which I really hate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't hate anything, but I don't like them and they don't like me. They hate me, you know, but they want to use my name. And this is a fucking rich company and it's a mafia. You know, it's Naples. Okay. So they want, they want a new Avalon suddenly. Ah, mamoncita, mija. Okay. And so now I have to do a new Avalon before these infinite visions can be come out. So now I am composing songs for, for the new Avalon and I'm going to do like, a, because all the Avalons have a theme. Mm -hmm. And this one will be about Aphrodite. Okay. The, the goddess of love. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So I'm going to write about this. Y lo oiremos nosotros and we will hear it. Yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, that's going to come out next year. So. Oye, um, Tú que has tenido 30 años de trayectoria, ¿cómo viviste el, esta evolución del, de la música como negocio de como era antes a esta era digital? Well, digital makes everything easier, of course, but uh, the fact is that it can never sound as good as analog, but they have a lot of devices and plugins that emulate analogs, but it can never emulate completely. Uh, I used to do like I had like like Pro Tools with digi digi design uh, interface like maybe like that or something. Uh, Focus right there. I had that too. Uh, so I I found a uh, in in America uh, a company called Black Lion Audio which modifies this, and it's like five thousand dollars. They change everything. They do really good work. So it, it makes the sound really similar to the analog, but you have to pay a lot of money for that. Okay. And I'm really into that, like I'm uh, equipment wise, I'm, I'm, I'm crazy. I, I go nuts, you know, so <laughs> I want to have the best thing there. Okay. I have a microphone, which is like, it costs 5,000 bucks, $5,000. Y la parte de, de hacer dinero con la música, ¿cómo cambió? Everything has changed. Charles, el mundo no es el mismo de antes. You know, there's Spotify, there's YouTube. My Spotify statement was 40 bucks okay. last time. All my music, except classical variations and hymn to life, are not in Spotify. Because I refuse basically to pay, I have to pay to Spotify to put my music there. Yes. Uh, and that's very hard for me to take. Yes. You know. But I understand that people want to hear it. And ultimately, I want that, of course, as a composer, as many people as there could be would listen to my music. And now we are releasing classical variations and hymn to life as a new CD package, and I'm gonna put it to Spotify. I, I will sell my soul to the, <laughs> to the Satan, so, okay. so to speak. So, um, Timo, ¿cuál sería el consejo que le podrías dar a los jóvenes músicos para poder tener una carrera tan buena como la tuya? Well, it's a tough one because the, the competition these days is very difficult. It's, there's a lot of competition and. Music is not sports, man. I mean, it's art, and it's it shouldn't be competitive. Uh, basically, you have to find your own path. Darkness. That's the thing. In my lessons, it's not only about because everybody wants to know how to play speed of light. And stuff, and, you know, it's sort of, sort yeah. of, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, but I spend a lot of time dealing with their emotions. So I ask a lot of questions. And they're first like really like s surprised, like is this a guitar lesson or, or like psychology? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Si miran mis sandalias, hay tabla. You know, I I take the whole character in in mind when I teach. Okay. Because you are your guitar, you are your keyboards, you are your vocals. You know, you express yourself who you are. And if you're fake, your music will be fake. And that's the, that's the that's where the difficulty lies in, how to be true. And the only way to be true is to be hundred percent honest, hundred percent. That's hard. Yes, it's the hardest thing there is, but it's the only way, you know. Okay. If you're honest, you're gonna make it. You know, many people are like copycats. They copy stuff. You know, they. I I was like that too at the beginning. It's normal, but you cannot stay there. You have to find some way. Evolve. Yeah, and the way to evolve is to hire, for example, somebody like me as a producer, because I I I do a lot of like stuff. Band, I call it band coaching. Eres un maldito idiota con cara de mari. Okay. So and m m many times the band actually breaks up when, <laughs> when I do it because there is like obviously something wrong in the band. I rem remember one Finnish band particular they. They invited me, and I went to the rehearsal room. And I told them, "Play me a song." And I listened to it, and I'm very observative, you know, to my surroundings. I'm like a radar. I I I detect things. Yes. So I told them, guys, and there was a girl singer. You are playing great, but you are playing to yourselves. You are not playing as a group. They were only. Everybody was in their own world. They didn't even watch each other when they played. They were completely separated. So I, I, I said to them, how can you be a band if you are like five different people completely separated? Because you should be like as one, not like five separated. And then I started like um, using my, what I learned in my therapy, different techniques to bring some emotions out of them. And the bass player quit. He left. <laughs> <laughs> and the drummer got really angry. Because I was telling him, like, you know, the way you play is not exactly as you could play. You could play much better. Like, you're scared of something or, 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 what. or what. And the singer was really freaking out. He was crying, like... Eres uno de esos que empiezan a llorar? Suddenly, she was having all these flashbacks from her childhood and stuff. And I was even I was amazed what was happening. <laughs> You know, like, okay, wow, yeah, like, so we ended up, like, f like forming a completely new band, new name. Everything. Everything was different. And now they became actually quite successful because of this process. You know. Okay. They had some new members and they found a way to express themselves, to be honest, 100%, because they weren't. The very first thing what I do is I detect... In the, in the rehearsal room or something, if the band is honest or if it's a fake. Wow. Yeah. And if it's a fake, I'm going to tell it to them. <laughs> and they don't like it. They're going to hate me for that. <laughs> so they pay me money to tell them they are fake. <laughs> <laughs> Timo, eh, de la música actual, ¿qué escuchas? Well, I'm, I'm afraid I'm pretty boring in this because I still listen to the, my Beatles records. And I'll buy <laughs> Rainbow. Um, Dio, Ronnie Dio was a good friend of mine. Okay. You know, I was in Houston when he died. I was oh. in the same city. Yeah. I was playing Bologna Guitar Festival the day before, and I was playing two songs. Of course, Shadow Sphere. I guess what it was Yes. And Long Live Rock and Roll. And when I was playing Long Live Rock and Roll, he was dying in a hospital. Duke Aldridge, the guitar player, told me that. Wow. And next day I flew to Houston and it was all over the news that Ronnie Dio had died. You know, he was 67. And I, I remember still the story. I went to, with my wife at that time to see him in, in, in Finland, a show. And he had like a backstage, was like a container. So he was like a very small guy, like 163 or something. <laughs> and he was sitting there and there was like people queuing to see him before the show. And so there was this one guy before us, asked Ronnie like, how can you sing like that? You know, how is it possible? You know what he answered? No. Because I'm so good. That <laughs> was his answer. Because he was so fucking bored to hear it all the time. Because of course he knew he's good. Glad. So we talked to Ronnie and then 
we went outside and I watched to the, just happened to be watching to the sky, I saw two rainbows in the clouds above okay. the, uh, his dressing room. I swear to God, I saw two rainbows. Wow. And he put us a chair to the side of the stage and man, I mean, the monitors, they were only vocals, so loud, I've never heard, you know. And he was doing Gates of Babylon, all the classical stuff. You know, I could see he was like five meters from me. Wow. And after every show, every song, he went behind. It was Greg Goldie, the guitar player, and, and Rudy Sarzo in the bass, and one really strange keyboard player, which I don't remember. So after every song, Ronnie went behind the Marshall stacks, and he put like a towel, and he was like this. Like 20 seconds. <laughs> to me, it looked like he's like trying to enter com the mood. Com no, communicate with something. Yeah, like praying or no, he was like. To me, it seemed like he he's in touch with some energy. Okay. Because he was really quiet and like. Then he went back and immediately there, and there was like 20,000 people like this. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. So wow. I I got to see this guy and it was amazing, you know. Dime, ¿qué se siente ser un dios? And then he died, like we all do. You know? Yes. Ahorita que, que dijiste, ¿ya, ya, ¿ya no te gusta Stratosphere porque a todo mundo le gusta? Well, to me, it's like bread. It's like, <laughs> you know, you eat every day. So I understand that people like it because it's fun to play. But at the same time, I've played it like 10,000 times. So, you know. ¿Nos platicas de todos tus nuevos proyectos? ¿Qué esperar de, de ti, Timo? Well, Infinite Visions is, I have a singer from Peru called Jorge, and he's like, I played a, a show with him last September in Peru. And I first had like Michael Vesquera, who was like Ingrid Malmsteen vocalist. Whoa. Yeah, but the songs were like, as they were born, I could see that Mike couldn't sing this. It was not like made for his voice. They're more like strata songs. Okay. So suddenly I was in touch with this Jorge from Peru and, Then I re suddenly remember, oh, you're the guy. And then, yes, yeah, I, I am the guy. Don't you remember me? I said, no. And then we had like WhatsApp call. And then I asked him, was I nice to you? Because I really didn't remember. Yeah. He said, yes, I was nice. But at the end of the show, I threw beer to his face. Wow. <laughs> I do it sometimes. Uh, he said he loved it, actually. You know, because it was... It wasn't a hostile thing. It was more like an affect affectionate yeah. thing. In the moment. No? Yeah. So he's, he's like Kiske, he's really, really good. You know? Okay. So it's, it's going to be like Vision's style of strato music. Okay. And the Avalon is going to be with, at least Ellis Root will be there again from Amaranthi. And I hope Russell Allen, I really hope uh, Jörn Lande could do some stuff, but Jörn is like very difficult guy. You know? Maybe Russell and, and maybe Rob Rock. And I have actually something in, 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 in the works which will be the biggest thing I've ever done. And, and this is a weird thing because I'm, I don't subscribe to any religion, you know. I'm not a religious person at okay. all. I'm a spiritual guy, but not religious. I, I don't like religion. But m the favorite film of mine is The Passion of the Christ. The uh, one with Mel Gibson? Gibson? Yes. And I watch it every day since two years. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> especially in the nights. Okay. And I'm like... And Ki Michael Kiske is Christian, so uh, I'm in touch with Mike, and we talked about this, and he said it's really how it happened. You know, this must be the only Jesus film where it really shows how it was, okay. not like he's only like smiling guy, and you know, it's fucking brutal. So my idea now is to make a rock opera of Ten Last Days of Christ. Okay. And suddenly all these people come to me, you know, all over the world. I'm meeting new people and investors and stuff for this. But this is a project of like maybe four, five years because it's monumental. It's going to be like three hours. Wow. Yeah. And... Um, ¿Y la música va a ser eh, parecida a la que has hecho o a lo mejor eh, vas a incluir una orquesta, cuerdas, todo este tipo de cosas? Well, that's the thing with me. You never know what comes out. I, mean, I, I don't plan things, you know. What I'm doing now is I have some help from some Christians, actually, who are, like, writing some 
chapter points. And the only thing I know is going to start in Getsemane, the thing, okay. the garden. And I know that when the time is right, I'm going to go to Jerusalem to write it. Okay. I book a hotel for one month and I go to the Golgotha and all the places and to get the, 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 vibes. the vibes. Yeah. And um, yeah, but I just feel like I don't call it God because God as a word has lost all its meaning to me. You know, this word has been misused to death. I call it like a loving energy, universal energy. Okay. Because in, in, in a metaphysical level, nothing exists. Like this table is not there. If you break this down, down to atoms, protons, neutrons, you go to the, to the centers, there's nothing there. Nothing. So we, we can explain that the whole universe and life and huma humanity is, we are part of God's big dream. We are a dream. Nothing more than that. You know, there was a time when I had like 3,000 books and I thought I can obtain wisdom from books. And the more I read, the more I realized, that the, the more I read, the less I know. So I gave everything away. And I, I, I realized that the wisdom doesn't come from any book. Of course, it's nice to read. And, you know, there are good books and stuff, which I think everybody can find. But ultimately, I think we can find the meaning in interaction with other people, in conversations, in ex expressing and exchanging ideas and feelings, like we are doing now. Yes. This is the meaning of life well, to me. Y estamos muy orgullosos que hayas venido a, a compartirlo con nosotros. And we are very proud to, to welcome here and talk about all of this. Yeah, it's important what we are doing. You know, it really is. Y vamos a hacer lo mejor para que llegue a todas las personas posibles y sobre todo a todas las, a las personas que siguen a tu música. That's a good thing. <laughs> It's a great yeah. thing. Uh, uh, anything else we want to talk about? Well, I just want to thank everybody because it's been an amazing road, like 30 years, I mean. And obviously people really love me here. I can see it and feel it. So it's like, it's well, something I never take it for granted. I really respect that and I really treasure it. You know, it's really something I'm deeply thankful for. And, and nosotros también estamos muy honrados de que hayas venido con nosotros. Nos falta todavía estar con él para un, un par de dinámicas que tenemos. Es, o sea, no es normal, no es de cada día poder tocar con Timo. Entonces, un, un sueño muy particular se va a hacer en este momento. But you have also have to understand, I'm just a guy who loves music, you know. <laughs> I, I, so at some point in my Facebook, it was like, quote, I'm just a guy who loves music. That's who I am. I mean, we are all here because of the music. And if we learn to find a way to communicate and, you know, support each other and, and be kind and, you know, tolerant, and the world would be a better place. I really feel this, you know. Muchas gracias por venir Thank con nosotros, Timo. Ha sido un honor tener a una leyenda del metal aquí con nosotros. Y síganlo en todas sus redes sociales. Todos sus nuevos proyectos los pueden encontrar. También ya ven que va a subir también algunos eh, discos a Spotify que antes no estaban, que los pueden oír, que les va a encantar de veras. Entonces ya lo saben, muchachos. Y como decimos aquí en Concierto en el Sofá, DJ, ¡súbele a la música! ¡Bravo!